There is a Buddhist teaching that says, to cultivate compassion, we should look at all beings as if they were our mother, as if they were once somebody who cared for and nurtured us. And when I first heard that, it was so impactful. But then I thought, well, wait, are we talking about my mother? My mother forced me to wear a pink cast when I broke my wrist, even though I was a tomboy and I wanted a blue one. And when she took me to work with her, she told me to go outside and chase lizards, even though outside happened to be a lumber yard with acres of towering wood stacks and machinery and strange men. She used to lay hands on me and try to cast out demons because she thought my strong-willed nature was of the devil. Affection wasn't natural for either of us. And in those moments we tried, it just felt obligatory and uncomfortable. And so our efforts weren't often. I never doubted my mother's love, though. She just showed it in her own way, like when she bought me a tetherball pole. Even though I was an only child, I don't think she understood the game or me. She came to all of my soccer matches, and no matter what was happening, I could hear her on the sidelines yelling, be there. And for some reason, without question, she let me name her black cat after the disciple, Simon Peter. <laughs> you could say we had an unorthodox mother-daughter relationship, but it worked for us because all we had was each other. My dad left before I was two years old, leaving my mom heartbroken, alone, and divorced by the time she was 22. She showed her pain the same way she showed her love, which is to say it wasn't evident. I knew she was aching because I was witness to her search for acceptance. First, we tried a megachurch, hoping to find community and answers. But it was easy to go unseen there in the thousands of people. And then we tried a Christian singles group. And I remember loving it as a kid because we went on camping trips. But for some reason, that didn't work out either. And then one day, we found ourselves in someone's living room. And in many ways, my mom is still there, sitting on that living room couch, stuck. I don't know who invited us, but I wish that I did. I wish that I did so I could scream at them. At first, it seemed like an ordinary house church. It was a group of Christians gathering together once a week to worship and to pray and to sing. Harmless, right? Until it wasn't. It didn't seem like a cult. We lived in regular houses, right next to your house. We went to public school with your kids. We sat impatiently right next to you at that same red light. Only we didn't follow an imam or a rabbi or even a priest. We followed an apostle who said he was getting direct revelation from God. And God was telling him to tell us that we were set apart from you, or we were chosen. God was telling him to tell us to turn our backs on the sick, on the poor, on the gay, or anybody who argued with our beliefs because it was too late for them. They had lost God's favor. To my mom, whose life had been shattered by my dad, who had been thrown into single parenthood, the apostle's living room wasn't such a bad place to be. He promised her guidance so she wouldn't have to do this alone and offered her belonging without judgment. He seemed to see her when she felt so unnoticed by everybody else. I remember when I was a kid once, someone asked me what my superpower would be. And of course I said to be invisible. But my answer would be different now because I saw what invisibility did to my mom. It didn't matter how much I stared up at her. My blue eyes mirrored my father's blue eyes, which were reminders of rejection, of being erased. We've all felt this longing for connection, to be noticed by somebody that we admire, to be cared for them is elevating. 
it can become the only thing that matters, especially when reeling from abandonment. I've interviewed dozens of theologians about what a cult is, and I've received dozens of definitions. My research has led me to define it this way. Cults are controlling. The leader claims to get a special God-given knowledge. There's groupthink, indoctrination, cognitive dissonance, and oftentimes, isolation. Someone who is raw, like my mom was when the apostle found her, is perfect bait. Growing up, my mom was in survival mode, and so I never thought to ask her what her dreams were. She never thought to ask mine either. But I think her dreams were to be married, have more kids, have a job she enjoyed, and be surrounded by friends. Her journey, though, stopped when she walked into that living room. There she found kinship. She became friends with the apostle and his wife, and we were assigned a pastor to watch over our family. I suppose that was the first strange turn our group took. Family, pastor, apostle. Today my mom is in the, pastor, or the apostle's inner circle, which is a very esteemed place to be. They drink expensive wine together in cognac, and they go on retreats to wine country and on Alaskan cruises. The apostle says he's called to the rich, and so my mom pretends to be. It wasn't always like this, though. The oddities evolved over time. In elementary school, I told my friends to rid their homes of Native American art because such symbols were evil. In middle school, I told my friends to stop going to their Christian churches because any organized religion was misled. In high school, I told my friends that any bad thing that was happening to them, whether it was their bad grade in math class or their parents' divorce or their boyfriends breaking up with them, that was God's way of speaking to them, punishing them. My mom was remarried by now to someone she had met in the group and we had outgrown the Apostle's living room. We had expanded to homes throughout the city, throughout the state even. And we were gathering once a month in a large auditorium to hear the Apostle speak. And his teachings were then distributed through PDFs and cassette tapes. And I hated it, because I too wanted to be seen. I too had been abandoned when my father walked away. But the Apostle's living room offered me no healing. And so I escaped, but not in an exciting, fleeing in the middle of the night kind of way. More of a slow, painful, peeling the band-aid off kind of way. It started by going to college. I was the first to do so in my family. I was only allowed to go with the agreement that I would meet weekly over the phone with our pastor. And so I did so reluctantly. But it allowed me to study religion and journalism. And when I finally got that job, that first newspaper job, I took a stand and I refused to hand over my paycheck to my stepdad. That was supposed to be a requirement because I wasn't married. And then I continued to inch away further by becoming a religion reporter. You can imagine my career choice was not looked upon with favor. Journalism was grievous, but religion reporting, that was spiritually dangerous. Going into mosques and temples they said, open myself up to demons, but I thought it opened myself up to compassion and understanding. Today, I run my own religion news publication. It's called Spokane Faves, stands for Spokane Faith and Values. Myself and a handful of reporters cover religion news in the inland Northwest, and I have 40 columnists who write for me, atheists, Buddhists, Quakers, Hindus. They're all writing from their faith perspective. But you can imagine the tension continued to build between my mom and I as I forged my own path and as I began to speak out against the cult. My hope was that we could agree to disagree. But to her, or at least to the men who oversee her, that was impossible. One day, she sent me two UPS boxes filled with my childhood things, my soccer trophies, my baseball cards, even my own baby photos. 
and with it was a letter that said, because I continued to disobey God's law, we can no longer be in relationship. I'm confident she did not write that letter. She only signed it. The story of my mom and I begins with her wanting to be seen. Eventually she was, but she lost her own sight and her voice in the process. She wanted community, but she sacrificed her family. Too many vulnerable people find a safe and comfortable couch, one they can sink into and forget their wounds, but they don't have to stay there. I wish that I could sit next to my mom and we could be awkward together again, but I can't be part of a faith community that tells people to leave their children behind. And she can't be part of a mother-daughter relationship that tells people to leave the apostle behind. I waited 19 years before I finally met my dad. I have interviewed cult survivors. People find their way out every single day. Lives can be repaired and relationships can be restored. If I hold on to hope hard enough, I believe that one day, just like I met my dad, I can meet my mom again. If I hold on to that hope, I think that hope is powerful enough to pull people off of the couch and through the front doors of the cult next door. And I believe that if I hold on to that hope hard enough, she'll be there one day to hit that tetherball back to me. Thank you.